Hello, SorcererCon. I'm Jess Hires, and this is Hardware Hacking 101. A little bit about me. I'm a practice manager here on the threat management team at Optive. I started as a consultant almost seven years ago. I've delivered almost every offering that Attack and Pen has. And I'm also part of the team that performs Optive's IoT testing methodology, which is uh, related to what we're going to be talking about today. So what is hardware hacking? Hardware hacking is attacking a group of devices that exist in the real world and communicate with other devices, usually over the internet, but sometimes it's just with your phone or something nearby. Some examples of these are routers, um, smart thermostats and cameras, your Androids and iPhones, and game consoles. And some of the objectives of hardware hacking might be command execution, bypassing authentication schema, or accessing functionality that isn't intended for the end user to have. When you're choosing a target, um, you want to look at what does the device do, what does the end user have access to, and we'll talk about that in depth in a little bit, and what things should be secured by the device. So for this presentation, I chose three devices, a router, a camera, and a smart bulb. The router connects to a modem and serves wireless internet, and it should protect your Wi-Fi keys and access to your network. The camera has a live security feed, and that feed should be protected to only people that have the password. And the bulb is pretty much just on or off and choose a color, but you don't want random people to be able to do that. An example of functionality that should be protected but isn't is um, this desk phone that I tested a while back. I noticed that when you go into the Wi-Fi settings, it would just display whatever you had saved previously. Um, in an office environment, that wouldn't be that big of a deal. Probably everybody's phone is connected to Ethernet or connected to the same wireless network. But in your house, you know, if you have somebody over who isn't on your wireless network, they could just go to that phone and pull up your settings and take a photo of your Wi-Fi key. There is a little bit of reconnaissance that can be performed before you crack open the device. If you know the device's model number, you can go check the manufacturer's website to see if they have any manuals or firmware files. Um, anything with a radio in North America should have an FCC ID. I'll cover that in depth in a little bit. And you can also look for blog posts of people who have hacked your target device in the past, um, as well as any GitHub code that they may have published. So for the router, I went to the manufacturer's website and I found some um, user guides and I also pulled down the firmware file. We'll cover the firmware file in depth in a little bit. Um, the manual didn't have anything terribly interesting except uh, the default admin password. When we dig into FCC IDs, there's a lot of useful information that we can find here. On the left are my three target devices. Um, you can see they're all 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. And then I chose another device on the right. This is a Flipper Zero, which also communicates on 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth, NFC, and a handful of other frequencies. You can also find some other interesting stuff like internal and external photos of the device, as well as user manuals in the FCC filings. The internal photos is probably the main focus here. Some of the things I'm looking for are the main integrated circuits, like the primary CPUs, um, as well as other peripherals that you might not be able to see from the outside. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in a little bit. When we're looking at these CPUs, we're generally trying to find the model number of it or some kind of marking that will identify the chip so that we can find a data sheet for it. A data sheet has a lot of information about a chip. You can see on the right here, it has the whole layout of this chip as well as what each pin does. On the left, we've got a detailed layout of what each um, symbol means and what they do. This is very useful when you're trying to find um, like serial lines and JTAG and other communication protocols. You can also find the mechanical properties of the chip. 
This is really useful if you are building a circuit board in CAD software and can't find a footprint. You can use this data to build the footprint for your circuit. You can also find block diagrams of how the logic flows through the chip, as well as communication protocols. Certain things do get removed from the SCC filings, um, such as block diagrams of the entire PCB and schematics. I mentioned blog posts previously. Um, this isn't all that common in my experience, but every once in a while you'll find a blog post of someone who has already attacked your specific de device in the past. In this case, I got really lucky and found a blog post for the router, and I actually found the root password for that, which we'll use a bit later. Now that we've finished reconnaissance, I'm going to start profiling the devices. Here I'm going to look at the different in and out or I.O. ports and peripherals, as well as the standard user environment and communication protocols in use by the device. For I.O. ports, you can see that the router has a bank of Ethernet ports, a Wi-Fi WPS button, a reset button, and an on-off switch. The camera had a micro USB port, but it was only for power, it didn't have any data connected to those lines. And the light bulb didn't have any port, I.O. ports. For the user environment, the router had an administrative website. Uh, where you could change a lot of the settings for the network, for Wi-Fi, and so on. The camera and light bulb uh, both use the same app, where you can turn the lights on, um, change the color, and see the camera feed. There wasn't a whole lot else there. For communications, I'm mostly going to be focusing on TCP IP communications, but there are a lot of other things that devices can use, such as Bluetooth, Zigbee, and so on. So in this stage, I ran nmap scans against the three devices. Um, the, the router had the most. It had the web interfaces that I mentioned previously, as well as SSH and UPnP. The camera and the light bulb didn't really have anything going on. They had this port 9999 open, um, which didn't really seem to do much of anything, but I didn't do any promiscuous capture of this traffic, so I, I didn't analyze that further. So at this point, we're going to open the device and verify any ICs that we saw during reconnaissance. We're also going to take a look at any storage media that's present and analyze the boot process. Opening the device is generally going to be pretty easy. You're going to be dealing with screws and plastic snap locks a lot. Um, sometimes you'll have devices that can't be opened easily and you'll need to use some force to open them. Um, for the light bulb, I've dremeled this channel open so I could access the insides a bit easier. At this point, you'll want to determine if the device has any kind of tamper detection. In my experience, this is pretty rare. Um, I've only seen it on enterprise-grade equipment. This is uh, a photo from a laptop or maybe a server. But generally, tamper detection is something that tells the device that it's been opened or messed with. Sometimes you'll find when you power on a device, it may prompt, this has been opened. Or it may not like if it's still open and ask you to close it and reboot or it could do something more severe, like lockdown functionality, or in very severe cases, delete the contents of the main processor. At this point, we're gonna confirm any ICs we saw during the reconnaissance phase. Sometimes you'll find that they use development hardware for the FCC filings, or maybe the processor has changed due to a chip shortage. Sometimes the marking on the chip isn't the model number of the IC, and you'll have to do a bit more digging to find it. It's usually pretty easy to Google these still. Um, the marking will be contained within the datasheet, but you'll just have to sometimes search through a couple of datasheets to find the right one. You'll want to use a multimeter to verify, um, because sometimes you'll have multiple 
ICs that have the same exact marking. At this point, we're also going to look at any storage media on the device. Sometimes it's present as an SD card or a hard drive. Sometimes it's soldered right onto the board. Sometimes um, it doesn't need very much storage at all and it just stores data in the main CPU. And sometimes devices don't have any storage at all. At this point, you'll also want to determine if it can be removed, um, does it have any encryption on it? Digging into the boot process can be a little tricky sometimes, and sometimes it can be very easy. In the case of a PC, you know, you can plug it into a monitor and keyboard and see the boot process in real time. Sometimes you get that on IoT devices, and sometimes you don't. Um, this is the boot process for the router. I'll show you how I got to this in a little bit, but basically what we're looking at here is a U-boot bootloader. Um, you can see here it says auto booting in one second. Usually that means you can interrupt it and mess with the bootloader a little bit. And then you can see some information about the boot image and the Linux kernel that gets loaded. Further into the boot process, this actually turns into a login prompt. Um, and back to that blog post I mentioned, I actually used that root password to log in. We'll also want to take a look at low-level communications, extract the firmware if we weren't able to find it on a manufacturer's website, and look for any unpopulated footprints on the circuit. There are a lot of different protocols that a device can use. Some of these, like UART and JTAG, are for debug purposes and testing. Some of these, like SPI CAN and I2C, are chip-to-chip -chip communication protocols. For UART, this is an asynchronous serial protocol. Um, asynchronous means that it doesn't have its own clock signal and you need to know that ahead of time. Or guess. For UART, we're usually using an FTDI cable or adapter. Um, one of the tools I use most often is called Bus Pirate. And lately I've been using my Flipper Zero as a transparent UART bridge. JTAG and SWD are debug protocols. These are generally for, um, you can get, you can take an inventory of the primary CPUs on a board with JTAG, and you can also do debugging with SWD. A lot of times you can pull the firmware with JTAG, and the tool we use for this most often to identify JTAG pins is JTAGulator, and then to interface with JTAG is the Seger JLink. SPI and I2C, or I squared C, are both synchronous serial communications. They have their own clock signal and they can be daisy chained. Generally, I'm going to use a bus pirate for inter interfacing with SPI, but you can also use a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. And then there's CAN, OneWire, MIDI, PS2, etc. Um, a lot of these can interface with a bus pirate, but generally you're just going to want to Google and find the best tool for the job. It won't always be obvious what um, a low-level communication is, and to find it you might have to use a multimeter and a logic analyzer. SIGROC is an inexpensive logic analyzer that I've used a lot, but most of the time I'm using a Sele logic analyzer, but it's very expensive. You'll also need generally a soldering iron, solder, flux, and pin headers. So pin headers um, usually get removed when they when a manufacturer sends a device to production. These are used for testing and programming and not needed by the end user most of the time. This is the router I'm targeting and I've went ahead and added pin headers right here. There was one extra step I had to do here. It looked like the manufacturer removed these two um, probably resistors connecting these pin headers to the CPU. So I went ahead and chopped off some little bits of wire and soldered them across those to bridge the gap. Once you've got pin headers in place, it might take a little bit of um, guesswork to figure out what it actually does. In this case, I hooked up a multimeter to figure out where the ground pin was, and then I assumed it was UART based on the number of pins, um, and hooked it up to my flipper zero. But 
These pin headers aren't always going to be what you think they are. You could have a lot more pins and only a couple of them are used, or they, a lot could be used. It, it all depends on whatever the manufacturer designed to do, decided to do during the design process. For the light bulb, I saw these TX and RX test pads on one side of the circuit board, and I thought that these were going to be UART as well. So I followed them to the other side of the board and soldered wires onto these three test points, or solder points. I hooked it up to my Flipper Zero, but all I got was garbage data. Um, I actually think that these TX and RX pins were the Wi-Fi antenna instead of uh, UART serial. There won't always be a place to solder a pin head or two. Sometimes there'll be test touch pads like this one. This was last year's DEF CON badge, and it had an ARM Cortex debug header on it. These are usually used for dumping firmware or flashing the device or debugging it in real time. You can also solder to these, um, but it's going to be tricky. They're usually really small. When we look at the firmware, we can grab it from the manufacturer's website like I did for the router. You can also dump firmware via JTAG. Sometimes you'll have to interface with a memory IC directly, um, such as the case with SPI or I2C. And sometimes you'll be able to dump the firmware via block devices once you have shell access. The tool we generally use for firmware analysis um, will start with Binwalk to unpack the firmware. They're usually compressed, sometimes encrypted. Um, so I unpacked the, the firmware for the router from the TP-Link website. We can see it has TP-Link firmware header, some headers related to U-Boot, and a couple other things. But the interesting one is this SquashFS file system down here. Um, this usually contains a, a Linux file system of some kind. So Binwalk has extracted all of the pieces that it found, and it even took the, the SquashFS container and unpacked it further into a folder. So this had a fairly standard Linux file system. It didn't contain my Etsy password like you would usually look for, um, but that didn't matter since that blog post I had found previously had the root password anyway. Here are some of the files that were in that Linux file system. You can see the binaries that were present on the system. You can see on the top right it had a BusyBox binary. A lot of these other ones were actually symbolic linked to BusyBox, um, which is very co fairly common on these embedded Linux platforms. You can also see some of the Etsy settings files. You can see Etsy password and shadow here but they were symbolic links to uh, files that didn't exist in temp. And you can also see some of the libraries that were present on the system at the bottom here. Another interesting thing that Benwalk will show you is the entropy graph. This is a visual representation of the data in your firmware file. So where you have the large sections of 0.0, .0 on the right here, those were probably all null bytes, and then the rest of the data was in these two plateaus here. And then if you if you run the entropy graph and you see very large sections of all 1.0, that might show you that that firmware file uses um, compression or encryption. If we look into the the different U-boot headers we can see some of the boot arguments that get sent when the device powers on. In this case, we can see the, the UART baud rate, which is important for interfacing with the UART serial line. This is a fairly common baud rate, um, which is what I, I guessed it would be from the start. I didn't have to do any brute force, but there are a handful of very common baud rates so that you would try first when you're 
interfacing with the device. Another thing we'll look at on the PCB is any unpopulated footprints. On the right, this was a board that was developed by Matt Birch on Attack and Pen here. This is an unpopulated board, but you can see the footprint is a USB-C header. And then on the left side, we've got the camera that I targeted for the presentation, and it has a micro USB header unpopulated here. So I went ahead and soldered on a micro USB header onto this device, and you can see I lifted one of the pads here while I was doing it. I had to do it again. Um, but that didn't actually end up mattering because that, that pin goes to something called IC or chip select, which uh, wasn't being used on this board anyway. Sometimes this will give you something interesting, like um, if the device is Android, it may give you ADB access or some other kind of debug access. But in this case, after I got the micro USB connector soldered on, it didn't actually do anything. Womp womp. Alright, so I know I've thrown a lot of information at you all in a very short amount of time, and to be honest, a lot of these techniques warrant whole presentations on their own. These are all intended to give you a starting point for where to look to in your own hardware hacking endeavors. That being said, I do have a lot of gear that I take with me, um, for example, to DEF CON to uh, do hardware hacking on badges and whatnot. This was my setup at DEF CON last year in my hotel room. Uh, me and several of my coworkers were actively working on different badges during the conference. And uh, several, we all had this, a very similar setup in our rooms. So out of the three devices that I had targeted for this presentation, I only had any success with one of them, which was the router. For next steps for the camera and the light bulb, I think for both of them I would want to try to get a firmware dump, um, as well as uh, some kind of man in the middle setup, packet capture setup for both of them to try to see what kind of communication protocols they're actually using. So bringing everything together, you would typically chain these hardware hacking techniques together to form an attack chain. Here are a few that I could think of that you might find while you're testing a device. This first one is the attack path that I actually took for the router I was testing for this presentation. I soldered a pin header onto the board, which uh, went to the UART lines on the processor. And then I used the root, root password from that blog post to obtain a root shell on the device. Another attack path that I've seen is soldering on a micro USB um, connector to an unpopulated footprint, which had ADB access and actually allowed a root shell. Another attack path you might find is uploading some kind of web shell to a device that has a web interface to obtain command execution. And then from there you might have to do some kind of privilege escalation to gain um, administrative or, or root shell. And then sometimes you'll be able to remove the hard drive or SD card or whatever storage it uses, extract or inflate that file system to add a user account or add a malicious binary to execute that boot and write that to the partition and reboot it. These are only a couple examples that I could think of. Um, there, there are tons and tons of attack chains that could be present on the device that you test though. To give you an idea of some other hardware hacking techniques, these are some things that I didn't perform on the target devices for this presentation. There is definitely a lot more I could have looked at on the web application for the router, as well as the mobile application for the light bulb and the camera. For mobile applications, Android is a bit more accessible, since you can run Android in a VM, and it's pretty easy to find APKs online. 
It's also very easy to obtain an unlocked Android device and flash a custom ROM and re route those devices to use for testing. iOS is a bit more difficult. You have to find an older device to jailbreak it and inject tooling and keep it on that older firmware. I'll also use uh, Burp Suite pretty heavily for HTTP traffic and Frida for hooking into mobile applications. If the device uses a lot of non-HTTP or encrypted traffic, I might have to put the device in a layer 2 or layer 3 man-in-the-middle configuration. From there, I can inspect any TCP UDP traffic going to and from the device, and I may see how to replay a TCP packet to turn off a light bulb, for example. Or if the device doesn't properly validate SSL certificates, I may be able to use a self-signed certificate to perform HTTPS man-in-the-middle and see how API calls are made out to the cloud. Again, Burp Suite will be pretty heavily used for that. There are a lot of other wireless protocols besides Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. You may need to use software-defined radio to analyze or interact with the device. The Flipper Zero can interact with some frequencies up to 1 GHz, but a good software-defined radio will typically be able to handle a lot more than that. The, ha the Hack RF1 can handle between 1 MHz and 6 GHz, um, and then there's a lot of different software out there that can interface with the hardware and handle demodulation. When it's difficult to obtain the firmware for a device, you may need to resort to some more drastic measures to extract its data. Sometimes I'll end up attaching very small wires to, right to the board to interface with the chip, and sometimes I'll try to remove the chip entirely. A hot air or SMT soldering station will be a huge help with that, and then I'll use a bus pirate or a chip programmer uh, with an adapter to dump the memory contents. And of course there's exploit hunting. You can emulate binaries for a lot of different architectures with uh, QEMU or KEMU, and you can load binaries into your favorite decompiler and debugger to search for vulnerabilities that may be used to exploit the device at a network level. These are a couple of tools I use to look at Android applications. dXplorer shows you the contents of an APK container, and you can view the various files it has stored. You can also extract libraries to load into a disassembler. APK Analyze Analyzer will let you export APK files of apps you have installed, and it will also show you a lot of information about the app, what permissions it uses, services it has installed, and so on. This is a JTAGulator. A JTAGulator probes for JTAG, SWD, and UART signals on a board. If you have a pin header that you suspect is JTAG, you can connect it in any order to the JTAGulator, as long as ground is connected to ground and all the other pins or wires are connected to inputs on the JTAGulator. The JTAGulator will enumerate which pins and wires are associated with JTAG at that point, and then you can use whatever information you find to connect it to a J-Link or other JTAG hardware. Sometimes there isn't a pin header. You can see in this photo I've soldered wires right onto various test pads on the board. Sometimes firmware extraction is going to be very easy. The ESP8266 and ESP32 chips and breakout boards have been super popular over the years. I've seen a lot of conference badges have used these chips. Most of the time, these are programmed with the Arduino IDE using a micro USB port, um, but sometimes they'll run micro Python instead of Arduino code. And you can usually dump the firmware on these pretty easily using ESP tool in the micro USB port. The router that I was working with had this memory chip near the UART pins, so I attached this SOIC test clip to my bus pirate to try to dump it. Unfortunately, I didn't have any luck dumping it, but I might have been able to if I spent a bit more time with it. And finally, here is a very drastic example where I removed the IC to try to extract data. I got these probes from AliExpress and used it to connect this EMMC chip that I removed from a device. 
These probes get placed on the chip according to its data sheet, and then the pin headers at the top get connected to um, the pins on a micro SD card reader. But there are EMMC chip readers out there, so you don't have to do this. Um, I just didn't have one at the time. So that was a lot of information. I will be in the Source ZeroCon Discord channel to answer any questions you have, and I will also be posting a PDF of my slides in there as well. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and thank you so much for joining Source ZeroCon.